in section 3.2, we say, now that we've gathered some data, what can we do with it? One of the things we can do with it is we can try to understand trends by visualizing it, by drawing diagrams, tables, charts, etc., to summarize it in some way that we can extract interesting information on especially trends and things like that. So I've got an example here with a data set from the MBA where I've selected out 32 players, or 30 players actually, um, from the entire league and I've listed some uh, variables for them. So using that table, uh, first of all we go through and we can um, notice some differences in the types of data that you'll see. So notice that some of those variables are numerical, meaning that you're measuring or counting something. So for instance, their age would be numerical, their height, points, rebounds, salary, etc. would be numerical because we're counting or measuring something about them. The other type of data is, is a categorical uh, variable and that's one that basically divides your sample or your population into categories. So for instance their positions would be categorical because some of them are one position, some are another position, and that variable divides them into different categories. Their team would be another categorical data, uh, categorical variable that distinguishes them into these categories. Um, then there are within numerical variables there are kind of two different uh, types you'll see. You'll see discrete ones which is basically when we count things and continuous one when we measure things. So you might count someone's age or count the number of children someone has but you would measure someone's height. That kind of idea. Um, this isn't a very important distinction because as I mentioned here Sometimes the line is a bit fuzzy, and it turns out we don't really treat those any differently. Numerical and categorical data we do treat differently. We do different things based on what type of data we have here. But discrete and continuous, we tend to do the same things regardless. So it's not quite as important, just something interesting to notice every now and again. So as you go through this section, there will be a variety of types of graphs, um, and some of them apply to both numerical and categorical data. Some of them apply to one or the other. So dot plots, for instance, work for both. And you'll see examples here. You can go through and, and read this, but the basic idea behind a dot plot is you have your uh, scale, and then on that scale you start putting dots to represent each value you have. So if we're summarizing their ages, we start putting their ages along this scale, and at the end of it we have this dot plot. And what we can see here is basically where the data is clustered and where it's spread out. So it kind of looks like the ages are, are clustered down between say 21 and 24 and then it gets rarer as you go up and then there are these um, separated data points out here at 36. There's a couple of unusually older players and these are what we call outliers. Outliers are these data points that um, are far away from the rest of the data basically. You can also draw dot plots for categorical data. You can practice working on a dot plot for the uh, positions. Uh, the same idea holds. You just, on the scale, you put the positions, those categories, and then draw dot plots for them as well. Then you have a frequency distribution, which is basically the same idea. And all you're doing here is you're counting how many dots you would put at each location. So there were two players with the age of 20, so there were two dots there, and you would just write down the frequency of two. So you write this in a table with one column being your variable and the other column being the frequencies. And so you list those out, and it's just a matter of counting how many fall into each category. Then you can also add a column for what's called relative frequency, which is basically just the proportion or the percentage of the total that this frequency represents. So if there are 30 total players, and there are two of them that are 20 years old, that relative frequency would be 2 out of 30. So 2 divided by 30, or you could write that as a decimal or as a percentage if you like. Um, any one of those is fine. So you have another example here of a frequency table where we're just counting the frequencies and 
writing down the relative frequencies as well. Uh, so in this case, you're looking through and, and looking for mistakes in the table that's been built for you, but it's the same idea. You can also do frequency tables or frequency distributions for categorical data. Again, you just list the categories and then the frequency, the number of times each one appears, and you can write relative frequency as well. Um, again, the goal behind this, just like with dot plots, is to kind of see where the data is grouped and where the data is spread out. So again, here you can notice that the most common positions are shooting guards and small forwards, and if you know something about basketball, you can make sense of why that would be. Um, the other three positions are less frequent and they're kind of evenly distributed across those other three. Then we have grouped frequency distributions. Group frequency distributions say instead of listing all of the possible values, let's talk about ranges instead. So there's an example here if you're looking at points per game, there's not much repetition in the data, but what you can do is you can divide them into ranges. You can say, okay, the first would be everything from 0 to 5, then 5 to 10, and so on. But the most important thing with a group frequency distribution is that if you just do it like that, then there's some overlap. And if somebody averaged exactly five points per game, they would kind of fall into both categories, which would be problematic. So what we do is we separate them. We do something like from zero to just less than five, and then from five to just less than 10, and so on. And um, that saves us from that overlap error. The other thing you want to make sure of is that these ranges are evenly wide. So we wouldn't have like zero to 4.9, and then 5 to 24.9. Uh, we want them to be in segments of 5 each time so that again you, you get a good sense of where the data is clustered and where it's more spread out. So there's a little um, description of how to pick your classes. Those ranges are called the classes. Um, nothing too involved but just a couple things to keep note of as you do that. So here's an example using that variable points per game. Once you set up your ranges, it's just as simple as counting how many fall into each range in your data set. And then again, you can uh, write the relative frequency column as well. Now, group frequency tables obviously only work for numerical data. You wouldn't group things with categorical because categories don't necessarily group together. So you'll stick to numerical uh, grouped frequency tables. And then we have histograms and bar charts, which are more or less the same thing. Um, the histogram is for numerical data. The bar chart is for categorical data. Histograms or bar charts do the exact same thing that frequency tables do and the exact same thing that bar charts do. They just count frequency. They count how often something happens. It's just a visual difference. So. A histogram is basically like if you take a dot plot and you kind of melt the dots together into a bar. So before we would have drawn dots kind of going up to five, here we draw a bar going up to five uh, for that first category of um, with a frequency of five and so on. So visually it's it's drawn with bars, but the core concept is the same as we saw with frequency tables and with dot plots, the same idea. Um, a histogram notice that the bars are connected to one another because these ranges sort of drift into one another. A bar chart is the same idea but with categories and in this case the only visual difference is that we separate the bars because it's not like it there's a natural flow from one position to the next, they're distinct categories. So that's really the only difference visually between a histogram and a bar chart is with a histogram, the bars are connected. With a bar chart, there's gaps between them. They're separated out like this. Then uh, there's another type called a stem and leaf plot, which basically takes each value in your data set and splits it into stems and leaves. So for instance, for 35, we would split that into a stem of three and a leaf of five. So the first digit would be your stem, the second digit would be your leaf, and basically what we're building here is a grouped frequency table uh, or histogram where the groups are in groups of tens. So all the tens go together, all the twenties go together, all the thirties go together, and so on. Um, just like we've listed here. 
But all we list in the last, uh, in the leaves column, is the leaves that go with each of these stems. So for instance, the number 13 has a 1 and then a 3, and then there's a 15, and then a 16, and then a 17, and so on. Um, these are listed in order, but you don't have to do that. Um, as long as you list them all evenly. Now notice what looks what this looks like. It kind of looks like a histogram or a bar chart laid on its side, where the length of these rows represents um, how many there are. It basically ends up counting frequency just like the uh, histogram or frequency table would do. So it gives you the same kind of information, but the advantage of a stem and leaf plot is that you haven't lost any information you have all of your data still listed here, and you can recreate your data set at any point if you need to. Then the last example is using a scatter plot. A scatter plot is the only one in this section that isn't interested in frequency. In this case, what you do is you look for a connection or a correlation between two numerical variables. So these again don't work for categorical, only for numerical variables. Um, and these are going to come back in section four in this chapter when we look at linear regression. So we'll get back to this concept of a connection or a correlation between two variables. So I'll give you an example here that you may suspect uh, a relationship between the points per game that a player averages and the salary the player receives. So what we can do is we can draw a grid with these two variables as x and y. And there's a little discussion here of which one should be X and which one should be Y. Make sure you read through this and, and understand the core concept. It turns out it won't matter too much right here, but later on we'll talk more about that in section 3.4. So you draw your grid, making sure to include the right scale to show the data points that you have. And then you start putting these points on here. So this first player averaged 23 points per game and had a salary of about 8 million. So you, on the points scale, you'd go to about 23, which is right between 22 and 24. And then on the vertical scale, the salary, you'd go up to about eight, and you'd put a dot right in that location, like this one here. And then you continue doing this and do it for all of them until you get this full picture. And the nice thing about this is it kind of shows us that there's this upward trend that as you increase the number of points per game someone scores, their salary tends to increase. There's a couple of data points that break that trend, but more or less the trend is in that direction, which kind of makes sense. Here's another example of a scatter plot. Again, you can look through how to build it and then how to interpret it, but the uh, core concept is, is the same. Then the last little bit of this section is how to use your calculator or how to use Excel to draw these graphs. You can read through this and um, use your calculator and kind of follow along and make sure that it makes sense that you can do these. But really drawing them by hand is not that hard. So this is kind of a bonus section of how to use your calculator or how to use Excel to um, draw these graphs from this section. And that wraps up section 3.2 at the end of all that, um, which is basically just all about visualizing data.